we're going to go ahead and get started. People will probably continue to trickle in, but uh, first, uh, our first speaker today for Grand Round is going to be Dr. Waratsko. She's going to talk to us a little bit about Zalapan and pediatric glaucoma, and then Lloyd Williams, our uh, second year resident, will be uh, discussing uh, something that, you know, I have no idea what it is, <laughs> but uh, elliptical uh, curve fitting. So uh, we'll go we'll go from there. Dr. Rotsko. Thank you. So good morning. This was a study that um, I was responsible for leading while I was at Pfizer last year, and we recently presented it at AAO. And it actually did get uh, best poster um, at the convention, so we were quite proud of the work. And again, it was um, the purpose of the study was to get a pediatric indication for Zalatan. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the status of some of the IOP lowering agents, but in the United States, there is no IOP lowering agent approved in children for pediatric glaucoma. And in Europe, the only one that's approved is actually uh, dorzolamide. Tamoptic is approved, but it never went through a formal uh, clinical trial for that approval. So obviously, uncontrolled glaucoma in young children uh, leads to a lifetime of blindness, and especially in Europe and in some of the emerging countries and emerging markets, um, glaucoma is, is a problem for these children. They do not have access to medical and or surgical care. And although in the developed countries in the United States, surgery is the mainstay of therapy, again, in um, Eastern Europe, you can imagine that surgery is not um, immediately accessible to these children. So a lot of these children do require medical therapy as they're waiting for surgery. And I think what's so sad too, what we found in the study, is that there's children that are diagnosed at the age of, you know, even in, I would say, eight, nine, early, early teens with very high pressures that have gone undiagnosed. Do the, due to the clinical need, medical treatment for pediatric glaucoma also includes topical and oral IOP lowering agents. And as I just told you, there are no good clinical studies to really show whether or not these drugs work. A uh, few ocular hypertensive medications have actually been studied in large controlled trials, and very few are approved. And the question was, latanoprost is used off-label in pediatric glaucoma patients, and we wanted to ask the question, does it really work? Is it safe? Is it efficacious? And should we recommend this drug for this group of patients? The, um, the EMA, which is the European Medical Agency, that's the regulatory equivalent of the FDA, wanted us to study babies as well. And they asked us to look at three groups of children, ages 12 to 18, 3 to 12, and 0 to 3. Why they wanted a three-year-old cutoff, your guess is good as mine, but that was the cutoff. And they also said, before you go and place these children in a phase three study, you need to do a PK phase one study. We want to know what the blood levels are of this drug in these children. The first study was the phase one, which was our pharmacokinetic study. We had children come in. We switched them in both eyes, 8 AM, with latanoprost. Again, it's a PM drug, but in this case, we were administering it 8 a.m. in the morning, and we didn't do punctal occlusion because, again, we wanted systemic absorption. Three to 28 days later, blood samples were drawn on these children at 5, 15, 30, and 60 minutes post-dose, and we were looking at latanoprost acid. If you recall, latanoprost is a prodrug that gets converted through the cornea and the ocular tissues by esterase enzymes, and we were looking at the acid form and this was measured with um, mass spec. We're also assessing safety evaluations as well. The phase three study, which was the large prospective randomized clinical trial, was a 12-week double mass multi-centered study. And if you think about your pediatric patients, you can imagine how difficult it is <laughs> to do an IOP study in children, especially the babies. Your standard IOP studies usually have three or four measurements during the course of the day. 8 a.m., 10 a.m., 12, sometimes 2, sometimes 4, because you want to look at diurnal IOP variation. Very difficult in a baby. You cannot keep bringing that child in, especially the young ones, to do an EUA in order to get their IOP. 
We had one IOP measurement, and the other thing that the regulatory agents wanted was they wanted the children divided and stratified by age group as well as diagnosis. They wanted children of all um, classifications for pediatric glaucoma studied, but they wanted to know specifically was there a difference in primary congenital glaucoma versus non-PCG. And they also wanted it stratified by IOP. So children with higher IOPs, did they respond just as well? Patients were randomized one-to-one, latanoprost versus tamoptic, and the little ones got 0.25%. Ocular systemic evaluations were scheduled, weeks one, four, and 12, and the primary endpoint was your traditional endpoint of relative mean change in IOP from baseline to week 12. And again, keep in mind that there was no specific time that the IOP was measured. The EMA was fine with this, the FDA was not. And this, again, we were only focusing on the EMA division. Secondary endpoints included percentage of greater than 15% IOP reduction from baseline, and that was considered responders. And what was interesting, when you think of responders in the adult population, we want to see at least 20, 25% reduction of IOP. Children, when we spoke to a lot of the leaders in this field, felt that if you got a 15% reduction with a topical IOP lowering agent, that was pretty good, and that classified as a response. And again, we also looked at efficacy analysis in the two subgroups. So the PK, this was actually what, you know, it's funny because I was more personally interested in the phase three studies, but a lot of people found this most interesting of all. There's very, if not, I think this is actually the first study that actually looked at plasma levels of a topically administered drug in children. And as you can see here, over the span, this is in minutes, so over the span of an hour, 10 to 15 minutes, there's a rapid uptake of latanoprost acid into the plasma, and it's much higher in the babies. So here you've got your greater than 18, we also looked at adults, here's your 12 to 18, your three to 12, and then again this rapid, um, very elevated increase in children. However, this was below data and studies that have been done in the past with adults. So this was still within what they call the therapeutic window or a safety margin. No temporary discontinuations, no permanent discontinuations due to adverse events, and there were no treatment emergent adverse events, and no clinically significant changes from baseline in any other laboratory. And I think, too, what was encouraging is that within an hour, the levels dropped off. The phase three results, we had 139 patients that were randomized at 42 centers, 137 were treated and were included in the intent to treat population, and 107 out of the 137 were in the per protocol population. And we ended up with pretty nice numbers in terms of the randomization. We had 53 on latanoprost, 54 on tamoptic, and also in the stratification the primary diagnosis for PCG was, was 45% of patients in each group. We found that the IOP levels were actually decreased in both the latanoprost and the tamoptic groups, 7.1 millimeters of mercury in latanoprost, 5.8 in tamoptic. And in the PCG group, we had 50% responders for latanoprost, and 46 responders for Tamoptic, which surprised us. And respectively, in the non-PCG group, the responder rate, again, it's 15%, greater than 50% drop in IOP, was 72% Latanoprost and 57% in Tamoptic. The hypothesis was that we were not inferior to Tamoptic, and our non-inferior was a margin of minus three millimeters. Usually in most adult studies, it's one and a half millimeters of mercury. We chose to go higher because again, in kids there's so many variables. You're dealing with thicker corneas that also can impact on the pressure. A lot of times you're doing um, tono pens, so you're not doing applination. So again, there were a lot of variables in this study that could confound that. And we said, okay, if we are within three millimeters, we're not inferior and that was accept acceptable with the agency and also the people that we um, were consulting with. 
We were non-inferior. But what was interesting is that in all groups, latanoprost actually appeared to be superior in terms of numerical numbers. These were not all statistically significant, especially in the PCG group. But in the non-PCG group, um, again, there was a clear difference in um, numerical value of greater IOP lowering in that latanoprost group. Was that the last two? Just because the, the last one was, yes. So the IOP reductions in the safety at baseline, and again, when we think about latanoprost and how long we wait for it to work or take effect, we were pleasantly surprised that at week one, we actually had IOP lowering effect. That was then maintained out through week 12. There was a little bump in week four, not sure why. Um, and here's your, tamo I'm sorry, the tamoptic. The tamoptic group bumped up in week four when latanoprost held. The other thing that was very, very interesting is you exclude, if you think about when you want to run a clinical trial and you're putting a patient on a beta blocker, so you want to exclude for anything that could be contraindicated, respiratory, um, cardiac issues. So we did exclude children with a prior history of asthma, respiratory, any sort of confounding systemic effect. But if you remember, these are babies, and a lot of these babies are not yet diagnosed with their respiratory problems. And what did emerge is a lot of these children, especially going on to Tamoptic, did have upper respiratory infections, viral infections, coughs. And again, you know, were we unmasking a prior non-diagnosed condition, or were these just kids getting upper respiratory infections? In terms of the safety, both drugs, again, were well tolerated, but we s did see this difference in treatment, um, in treatment emergent adverse events. So the discussion, well, the phase one pharmacokinetic study showed that we did have high levels in very young infants. Overall, the consensus was that this was not a safety concern and that it was probably attributed to lower body weight, lower blood volume, and lower hepatic blood flow for these children. But it just begs the question that what about other drugs that are applied to children at this age? And again, there are no good studies looking at plasma levels. But just keep that in mind when you do put your pediatric patients on topical, topical beta blockers. And obviously, alpha-GAN is contraindicated in these children for exactly those reasons. The adult dose um, administered once a day was not inferior to Tamoptic in reducing IOP levels. However, again, there was a greater numerical mean IOP reduction for latanoprost at each measurement point. And again, as I said, it was not always statistically significant. I think the takeaway here was that it was very, very surprising to see an outflow agent work in primary congenital glaucoma. That was basically what I took away and most of us took away from this study, is that really surprised us. We did not expect a prostaglandin to work in primary congenital glaucoma because of the anatomical abnormalities. You would think that only the aqueous um, reduction or the aqueous reducer or suppressor would actually work in these patients. But this was surprising. So again, there must be something going on through the uveal scleral outflow system that's being affected by prostaglandins that improves the outflow and helps to lower the IOP. And I think that's exactly what I just said. <laughs> Although the IOP lowering effect of lapanoprost was greater in the non-PCG patients, it also demonstrated a clinically relevant IOP lowering effect in PCGs. So in conclusion, this was what um, the regulatory agency was, was after, was it's at least as effective as Tamoptic, and it produces a clinically relevant IOP reduction across all patients, including PCG and non-PCG. We also had some patients with Sturge-Weber, we had some patients with aniridia, we had some patients with aphagic glaucoma, and we tried to break that down to do further sub-analyses, but it was very difficult because again, it's, you know, it's far and few between, and there's so many other confounding variables that are affecting the outcome of these children. And we also measured corneal thickness. I 
didn't even bring that into this um, into this poster or into this um, this presentation, but that was another interesting analysis that we did on these children. And if there's any questions, thank you. Yes. Exactly. Exactly, and we also um, looked to see if prior surgery actually also affected the outcome, but again, the analyses, the numbers were too small, and we... You're right. So it's and it's funny you bring that up because this really was a medical push. This was really us, you know, as you said, it's it's this it's a business, you know, there there usually has to be commercial value for a f company to want to do this. But a lot of it was the the medical value that this brought. So it was nice to get it recognized. Thank you. Thank you.